Uh, okay, so today it's a pleasure to welcome Lauren. Um, so Lauren did her PhD uh, at CES, actually, uh, under the supervision of uh, Alan Sacha Brown in 2008. Um, she then went to Cambridge for a postdoc and uh, was hired as a faculty in Toulouse. Uh, she is now a member of uh, the uh, Institut Universitaire de France. Uh, and she works at uh, IRAP on uh, stellar physics, and in particular the question of um, uh, the impact of uh, magnetic fields on, uh, on stars. Um, that's it. So maybe I should also mention that in uh, 2016 she got a prize for, from uh, the French Society of Astronomy and Astrophysics for young faculties. And uh, I think this is the first time uh, I met you actually <laughs> in person. Um, okay, so thank you very much for um, accepting to be here today and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much Sandrine. So I'm going to share my, uh, my screen up. Now you should see the, the screen, right? Yes, okay. Okay, all right. yes perfect. Okay, good. Uh, all right, so we, uh, I'm going to, to uh, give you a, a review of uh, only some aspects of uh, what we can tell when we have uh, models and simulations about how we understand uh, the uh, magnetic field of stars. Uh, so I'm tr I will uh, try to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the stars which uh, are more or less similar to the sun, uh, cool stars on the main sequence and um, where the mechanisms are more or less the same as uh, what happens in the sun. Uh, and also of uh, more massive stars where the uh, magnetic field uh, as observed is completely different from what we uh, get in the sun and on cool stars. Okay, so let's start of course with the, um, the, main, uh, the main star we know is a magnetic star. This is the sun. This is the, the, the star we know uh, the best because we actually uh, resolve uh, the, its surface. We can uh, see uh, the, manifest the main manifestation of the magnetic field uh, on this star, which uh, is sunspots. So these sunspots are uh, large features at the surface of the sun that you can see here. I hope you can see my, uh, my arrow, my cursor, right? Yes, it works. Okay, uh, and uh, so you see these uh, these monsters which uh, erupt at the surface of the sun, which have typically the size of the Earth, something like this, uh, and which are a little bit darker as their surroundings because the magnetic there is a strong magnetic field which prevents uh, an efficient um, uh, transport of heat at this uh, particular location. Okay, so they usually. Uh, appear at the surface of the sun as uh, bipolar structures with a positive and a negative polarity because you, they, they look like big arches of uh, magnetic uh, flux tubes coming out of the sun. Uh, and in fact, as you probably know, you, this is uh, the, how the sun looked like in uh, 2014, a magnetogram of the sun at this uh, moment. And uh, actually, if you look in time, uh, what happens, we have now uh, direct observations of sunspots since Galileo, more or less, so 400 years of observations of sunspots. Uh, and we uh, know that uh, we have a cycle, a magnetic cycle at the surface of the sun, uh, which is visible really on the sunspots. And uh, that you can see here, this is in time, and this is uh, more or less the uh, number of sunspots you have at the surface of the sun in time. So you see it's very uh, periodic uh, in, in uh, particular in uh, in, um, in the duration of uh, the cycle, then you have a modulation of the amplitude of the cycle. Uh, there, there are, there are uh, strong cycles and weaker cycles. Uh, and this is not completely up to date, sorry. We are, uh, we undergone already the minimum. It was uh, officially in December 2019, so uh, almost a year ago. And we are uh, starting now with cycle uh, number 25. Uh, this is uh, the, the first one is uh, started uh, at the beginning of the observ direct observations of the sunspots. There is a, another feature which is uh, quite uh, interesting, especially when we want to produce models, we want to reproduce this kind of stuff. So we want to reproduce the cyclic behavior of the magnetic field of the sun. And we would like also to, um, to model correctly uh, what happens when we follow the uh, position of the sunspots at the surface of the sun in time. 
And this particular feature is the fact that the sunspots appear mostly uh, at the beginning of the cycle, as you see here, at mid-latitudes. And then the appearance of the, these uh, sunspots is closer and closer to the equator. Uh, then you reach a minimum of uh, activity. You have uh, at this moment a reversal of, uh, actually the reversal of the large scale magnetic field at, uh, happens at the maximum, sorry. Uh, and uh, then you start again a new cycle uh, with the appearance at mid latitudes and closer and closer to the equator. So this forms what is uh, called the butterfly diagram because of its resemblance with butterfly wings. Okay, so this is typically, this is a quite uh, nice because it's a really robust features, really uh, periodic and uh, really uh, uh, ordered features which come out of uh, a complex astrophysical object with a lot of turbulence as a lot, as a, a lot of, uh, like a lot of different uh, astrophysical objects. Now, if we uh, look at uh, stars which are uh, a bit different, but uh, which are still cool stars on the main sequence, so meaning that uh, they still have a, a structure which is more or less similar to the sun, they possess a convective envelope and a radiative interior, as I will show you just in the, in the next slide. Uh, so if we look at the magnetic topology of, uh, the, uh, of the field in a, of uh, these uh, cool stars on the main sequence, uh, we can look at it in uh, what uh, the very people who produce this kind of diagram call confusogram. <laughs> so it's, it's called confusogram by, the, by them. I'm going to try to explain it to you as, uh, as clearly as possible. So you put here on the y-axis the mass of the star and here the rotation period of the star. So I forgot to say that it's thanks to spectropolarimetry, which has been developed for the last decades, that we know both the amplitude and the topology of the magnetic field on uh, stars other than the sun. So this enables us to uh, see that, that to, to uh, put these uh, different uh, stars in uh, such a such a diagram where the symbols will represent the characteristics of the field. So uh, the first thing is the bigger, the bigger the symbol, the larger the magnetic field. Okay, so large symbols mean a very strong field. Uh, by the way, you see the sun is up there. Uh, the uh, color of the uh, symbol represents how poloidal or toroidal is the field. Poloidal means that uh, the magnetic field uh, is uh, mostly uh, contained in the meridional plane, meridian plane, and toroidal means that you have components outside of the plane, if you want. Okay, so you have uh, uh, toroidal is really along the equator, if you want, and poloidal is mainly contained in the meridian plane. Uh, so, for example, this star is, has a very strong toroidal field. This star has a very strong poloidal field. Okay, and then the, the shape of these symbols represents uh, how complex is the field. So uh, when the symbol is more or less round, it means that the field is quite simple, meaning it's more or less a dipole. Okay, and when you have a complex uh, shape like this, like this star uh, shape of the star, uh, this means that uh, the field is much more complex, it has a more multipolar structure, and it's not a simple dipole but it's more complex so with a lot of uh, changes of polarity at the surface, okay? So now you have uh, the description of, the, of this. We can try to see what kind of uh, conclusions we can get from these observations. Uh, so uh, what we see is that uh, you have a distinction in mass, okay? If you are up there, it seems that the fields are mostly multipolar and below a certain mass, the field will be mostly dipolar. Also, below uh, a certain rotation period, the field seems to be very strong, okay? Here you, you manage to build very strong fields when you rotate fast, okay? A small uh, rotation period means the fast rotation. Uh, also, there is a striking feature here. You have a very... Uh, Uh, now called the bistability, uh, bistability region, where you have two states of uh, magnetic fields around the same region in mass and, and uh, rotation. 
Uh, and this is more or less uh, all uh, we can say. If we also, for uh, more or less stars which are solar-like, the, the same mass, if you increase rotation, you will increase the level of toroidal field. You see that you have more and more blue symbols here. Okay, so all these things are also useful for people doing models, try to represent these kind of things uh, with, uh, with nice, um, the, the nicest models we can have. Okay, uh, this was just a snapshot at a particular time for uh, stars. And now if we want to have uh, an idea of uh, the possibility of magnetic cycles also on other stars, so not just for the sun, uh, we need to look at them in time, of course, and uh, on the sun, uh, th this is something I forgot to say as well, that on the sun, it's, uh, the cycle is 11 years for the sunspots. Uh, so it means you need to, to observe stars for a very long time if they are going to, to have a cycle which are more or less similar to what we find in the sun. Uh, so in fact, in the 70s and 80s, uh, there was a tracking of the chromospheric activity on, uh, on the large panels of stars, which were more or less solar-like. Uh, and uh, there, there was a connection, uh, still a connection, between chromospheric activity, eruptions, and all, all the, that this uh, activity which can be linked directly to the magnetic field. So we imagine that this chromospheric activity is a good proxy for magnetic activity. And uh, there were cycles which were seen in the chromospheric activity on a large number of stars on, on this large survey. And what you can uh, look at is the relationship between the rotation uh, period, more or less, uh, this will be defined in terms of Rossby, I will come back to this, and the cycle period of the magnetic field. Okay, and if you look at this, you see that so the Rossby uh, number, which is, uh, which is defined here, is a rotation period of the star divided by uh, this tau is the convective turnover time. So more or less the time it takes for convective motions to, uh, to cross the whole convection zone, okay? Uh, and uh, this is given by models mostly. Uh, but if you look at this uh, proxy, you see that there is a direct relationship, uh, more or less, if you rotate faster, then the cycle period will be shorter. Okay, so it seems that there is a good relationship like, like this when you look at the chromospheric activity. Now, thanks to spectropolarimetry, we have direct measurements of inversions of magnetic field. So the, we have now a few stars, uh, more, more and more stars for which we have a good idea of a uh, magnetic cycle and we can try to relate again this uh, duration of the magnetic cycle with the, the, the rotation period of the star, okay? Uh, so there are a few here that I cite. This one is interesting because it's really a solar twin, more or less same mass and the same uh, rotation period as the sun. And uh, there is a magnetic cycle which was uh, made uh, a clear on spectropolarimetric uh, uh, observations to be more or less of 14 years compared to the 11 years of the sun. Okay, so uh, one thing it's, which is interesting for, for people doing model is that we can have some trends, try to see if, the, if we can first get a cyclic magnetic field, and then if we uh, make our model rotate faster, if this uh, cyclic magnetic field will have a shorter cycle or not. So if we uh, now want to uh, model all this, we have to look at the ingredients which are necessary to produce this magnetic field. And uh, in fact, the necessary ingredients will be the flows inside the sun. Okay, so you, uh, inside the sun or, or uh, in general in stars. Okay, so uh, the sun is uh, divided, uh, it can be um, uh, schematically uh, represented uh, like this. We have a radiative zone here. Uh, where the transport of heat is made by the photons, by radiation. And from 0.7 uh, solar radius to the top, here uh, convective motions are playing a role in transporting heat, okay? So here you, uh, you produce uh, 3D uh, complex uh, turbulent motions, which are very good ingredients to stretch and shear the magnetic field all the time. And this is a really necessary ingredient to be able to amplify the magnetic field uh, we, we, we uh, have at the beginning, at the formation of the star possibly, and to produce what we call a dynamo effect. Okay, so I will come back on this uh, in the next slide. Um, 
you uh, you do have also a rotation of the sun, of course. Uh, what was made uh, evident uh, thanks to helioseismology is that uh, the sun rotates faster at the equator than at the poles. Okay, so we we and especially in the convective zone of the sun, uh, and this is what is called differential rotation. Uh, the, if you sit at the equator here, you make three turns of the sun, while if you sit here, you make only two, okay? Uh, so uh, you, you have this uh, differential rotation, which will also be a key process of uh, the dynamo effect. Uh, and this is just to show you uh, the, the, uh, what is used by helioseismology. And we do know also, thanks to local helioseismology, this is given by Global, uh, local azure seismology tells us about uh, this uh, large scale flow, which is called the meridional flow or meridian flow, because contain the meridian flow, which is uh, schematically represented here as a one big cell per hemisphere. In fact, we, we know this flow at the top uh, layers of the, um, of the sun because we can actually observe it, but it's, it's too difficult to observe it uh, uh, in the deep interior. Uh, so we only have to assume that there will be a return flow somewhere to conserve mass, okay? But it's, it's quite difficult to observe it uh, well, this marginal circulation. Okay, so now uh, we continue in the, in the theory to try to model all this. Uh, and to model all this, we need to uh, look at the uh, evolution equation of the magnetic field, the induction equation due to the presence of uh, a velocity field and due to the presence of uh, diffusivity, okay? So what you see here is the decomposition of the induction equation. Uh, and in fact, what you have is uh, the effects which are going to be sources of magnetic field, uh, the term which is going to be transport of magnetic field. And uh, uh, here you have uh, an effect of amplification of the magnetic field by compression. And here, this is an effect of uh, a sink of magnetic field. You kill your magnetic field also by magnetic diffusion, okay? So if we look a bit more closely at the, these different terms, uh, the sources of, of magnetic field can be uh, uh, of a different uh, nature. Uh, you have what is uh, um, traditionally called the omega effect, which is due to the differential rotation. So if you start here from a poloidal field, as you see here, if you rotate faster at the equator than at the poles, you're going to shear your magnetic field into, so you start here with the poloidal field and you shear it into a toroidal field. You wind up your field around the, the sphere. And then uh, it's the opposite effect. You want to, uh, from the toroidal field, to reproduce a poloidal field, okay? And this can be done by the uh, helical motions inside the convection zone of the sun. This is called the alpha effect. A combination of small scale motion which uh, uh, transfer into a large scale magnetic field. Uh, and this is another uh, source term which is, uh, which is uh, evoked in for the sun, invoked in for the sun is what is called the Babcock and Leighton source term. This is due to the fact that you have eruptions of uh, flux tubes at the surface of the sun, which produce uh, the sunspots. And these, you have a small uh, tilt angle uh, between the uh, axis, the, the east-west direction, and the um, axis of these uh, bipolar structure, okay? You see you have a small tilt here when you uh, draw a line between the minus and the plus uh, centers, okay, the bipolar spots. And this, when the, you have a decay of these uh, regions, of these bipolar sunspots, uh, you're going to be able to reverse the previous poloidal field you had here, thanks to this negative polarity, which is uh, diffused away towards the, the poles, okay? So this is another way to reverse the global poloidal field. And this is due to surface effects only. Okay, uh, and now you have transport of magnetic field, mostly by the marginal circulation, okay? Um, so what I work on is uh, numerical simulations, 2D or 3D. You can do 2D and, and 3D. Uh, in 2D, you will have to uh, solve this induction equation, and you will have uh, to, uh, to prescribe some of the important physical processes as turbulence, for example you need to prescribe these different uh, ingredients uh, to prescribe your velocity field to know how the magnetic field will react to this uh, velocity field. 
And you can do full uh, 3D uh, simulation, uh, meaning you're solving the induction equation coupled to the Navier-Stokes equations and to the energy equation, the full MHD magneto hydrodynamic equation. So two approaches, of course, uh, very different, but we can uh, use both. Okay, so I just this is just a, a, a summary of uh, what I just told you uh, for the different um, uh, ingredients. You start with a poloidal field, differential rotation produces a toroidal field. With the alpha effect, uh, small scale convective motion, you can again reproduce a poloidal field which will be of opposite uh, polarity. And also with the Bacock Clayton mechanism, you can go from a toroidal field to a new poloidal field, thanks to the emergence of this pulse. An important ingredient in this uh, Bacock Clayton model is the fact that you have meridional circulation, which can link the source uh, regions of poloidal and toroidal field. Okay, so the surface uh, field will be advected also by this meridional circulation. So now we can uh, try to do models. So this is a 2D uh, model, for example, uh, where you solve only the induction equation and we separated the poloidal field and the toroidal field. Okay, so here you recognize, uh, this is, uh, we are going to use the babcock layton uh, model. This is an advection by the uh, meridional circulation that you prescribe, and this is diffusion, okay, for the poloidal field. The toroidal field comes from the omega effect acting on the poloidal field. You have again advection by the meridional circulation, diffusion uh, in these two terms. Okay. If you build this kind of models, uh, you actually produce a reversal of magnetic field periodic in time. Uh, you can, uh, with uh, reasonable ingredients, uh, get an 11 year cycle. Okay. What you see here is the advection of the poloidal and toroidal magnetic field inside uh, the uh, convection zone of the sun because mostly of the meridional flow. So uh, what you see here is that uh, the magnetic cycle period, you can look at these dependencies on the various parameters you're, you're using. Uh, so using this large scale meridional circulation, we get a very strong dependence of the cyclic period of the, the sorry, the period of the magnetic cycle with the amplitude of the meridional circulation. You see, uh, in fact, this is uh, quite uh, understandable. The faster you will transport your field, the faster also it will reverse. Okay, so um, if the amplitude of the flow is very high, the cycle period will be very short. Okay, so we... Sorry? Can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, just a technical one, but uh, to mm -hmm. do simulations like this in 2D, uh, what do you need? Uh, what is a typical CPU time, let's say? To ah, the, it, this is uh, on, la on your laptop, uh, very fast. Ah. No, the, the, this, this one is, uh, is not at all uh, demanding. This is what is nice with these 2D simulations. Uh, they are very uh, fast. You can uh, have a very large uh, parameter, uh, parametric survey. Uh, but they lack a lot of, uh, of things. Uh, in particular, you have to prescribe yourself what you put as a, as a source term of magnetic field, and there's no back reaction of the field on the flow. Okay. So this, this is the main uh, drawback, of course. Okay. But you can learn some stuff about this. So uh, we can ask ourselves, if, 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 we're, if we are happy with this kind of uh, model for the sun, maybe we can ask ourselves, is it applicable for other stars, more rapidly rotating? Uh, the problem is that we have no idea of the meridional circulation on other stars. Uh, it's already difficult to see on the sun, so on, also on other stars, uh, no way we can see uh, the amplitude of the meridional circulation. But we have 3D simulation. So here, the 3D uh, simulation I show you is 3D hydro simulation, where you develop convection, you rotate uh, your, um, your uh, convection zone, uh, here it's more, much more demanding uh, in terms of calculation, of course, because here you, you solve the full uh, hydro equations in a sphere, okay? You produce a reasonable differential rotation naturally, self-consistently, and you also produce self-consistently a meridional circulation that you see here, the contours of, okay? This is for a model rotating at what ta one time the solar rate, and this is five times the solar rate. And what uh, Ben Brown gets in this uh, simulation is that, in fact, the meridional circulation 
uh, amplitude decreases when you uh, increase the rotation rate. Okay, so you see maybe already that it will be a problem because if you reintroduce this kind of prescription in the 2D model, you, you rotate faster your, uh, your uh, star, then the amplitude of the flow needs to be smaller, so you prescribe this. Uh, if the uh, amplitude of the meridional flow is smaller, naturally the cycle period will be much longer. Okay, and this is indeed uh, what you see here. Uh, the cycle period in terms of uh, rotation rate uh, increases. So this is in fact opposite to what I showed you in the observations, which uh, seems to tell us that uh, fast rotators have short uh, cycle periods. Then you can uh, always play around with the marginal circulation and, uh, and modify the profile to, to reconcile both, but uh, we can also say that it's just 2D models, it's too simple. In fact, uh, there were recently 3D models looking uh, also at this, where you actually now solve the full MHD uh, problem. Um, it's nice because they managed to get uh, cycles. Now there are more and more 3D simulations where you don't put any prescriptions for the sources of magnetic field or transport of magnetic field. You let it do its stuff uh, itself consistently and you produce magnetic cycles at large scales. You see here, for example, uh, some kind of uh, magnetic structure uh, with a positive polarity and a few years later with a negative polarity. Okay, you see nicely some kind of butterfly diagram here with the cyclic reversals. This is at one solar rate. Now this is for a star which rotates less fast, for a model which rotates less fast, and now the, the cycle period is shorter. Okay, so it's not exactly the same uh, the same scale in time, but uh, this, it's indeed the case that uh, the, fast, the, the slower you rotate, the shorter the magnetic cycle. So again, uh, opposite to what is uh, seen apparently in observations. So this is still work in progress, <laughs> in fact, I have to, to say. Um, in these uh, 3D simulations, what is interesting is, is that the marginal circulation has no role in setting the cycle period. So completely different from what we uh, imagine from the backhawk layton uh, model. And another thing is that it cannot be a backhawk layton model because there are no spots in 3D uh, models. Okay, uh, so they cannot play a role at all in the uh, dynamo process because you don't have, uh, you don't have uh, spots actually emerging at the top of your domain. Uh, what I show you here is an example of a 3D simulation where you do see reversals of the magnetic field. Okay, you see here the polarity of the field uh, and uh, evolving in time. It's red and it's going to be greenish uh, blue uh, after some time. So you see large scale field reversing, but there are no spots here. The magnetic field stays more or less close to uh, the uh, limit between convective and radiative zones and never makes it to the top to produce spots as what is, uh, what is thought to happen in, uh, in the sun and in uh, cool stars in general. So uh, this is uh, not so surprising because uh, these uh, 3D global simulations, uh, they have difficulties to, uh, to um, capture these uh, uh, small scale structures which will be able to rise up to the top. They need to have very uh, small diffusive uh, uh, magnetic diffusivities so that these small scale structures don't just diffuse away before they are able to reach the top. So it's not exactly true, there are no um, uh, spots uh, emerging in 3D models. Uh, it starts to happen, you see here arches of magnetic field being built into 3D models, but it's still difficult uh, to have uh, to construct a real butterfly diagram in these uh, 3D models. So again, this is uh, also still a, a work in progress uh, a bit. And, this is, and there is uh, some uh, intermediate model, in fact, that you can build, uh, which is a kind of combination between uh, 2D and 3D. Uh, well, this is actually 3D, as you see uh, here, you have both uh, the surface here and the representation of the meridional uh, um, plane. Uh, but uh, here, again, you just solve the induction equation. 
and you uh, you will uh, model the uh, emergence of spots by applying a radial velocity which takes the uh, field uh, which is built at the bottom of the convection zone and make it rise to the top to produce spots and you actually see the spots here and in this kind of model which is called 3d kinematic you can actually produce uh, the spots and look at the backcock layton model at play, really reversing the poloidal field periodically. Okay, so this is uh, what uh, some people are now tending to these models, even again, if they are very simplified because they, you, you, uh, you have no back reaction again on the, of the magnetic field on the velocity. Okay, uh, so let's move on now to uh, what I was telling you about the uh, magnetic topology uh, in cool stars. Um, the, I, I told you that uh, the rapid rotators uh, tended to have a strong poloidal field and the, the slower rotators tended to have uh, possibly uh, more uh, complex multipolar fields. Okay, so in fact, uh, this is what is also seen in numerical simulations. So now it's 3D MHD simulation when you solve the whole uh, set of MHD equations. And uh, in fact, there is, a, it seems to be a big role of uh, the Rossby number, uh, which is the ratio between, uh, so now it's uh, not defined the same as the Rossby number I was telling you before, but it also measures the same kind of uh, competition between uh, terms. It's the, com it's the ratio between inertia and Coriolis, okay? So what you see on this plot uh, is uh, these different points represent different 3D simulations. This is uh, taken by the, from Gastine. Uh, and here you see the dipolarity of the field as a function of Rossby. And what you see is that when Rossby is small, meaning that uh, the Coriolis force will have a strong impact, uh, it will be uh, important in the dynamics, uh, then the uh, dipolarity can be important. You can have dipolar field uh, easily when the Rossby is small. But after you cross a certain Rossby, then you lose this dipolar structure, okay? So this, uh, this was also seen in uh, planetary dynamo models uh, already in 2006. Um, there was a, this was mostly a calculation done with a very small contrast in density. We know in stars the contrast in density and rho, which is uh, shown here, uh, is quite high. And if you look at the n rho 3, for example, you have no points with n rho 3 uh, which are dipolar. And this is, uh, of course, a problem because we know that uh, some stars have dipolar fields. Okay, so it seemed at this point that uh, you couldn't produce uh, dipolar fields uh, with the high stratification. Now we are working with a PhD student. Uh, she, she's uh, in the process of uh, writing something about a new simulation where we pushed a little bit uh, the, uh, the turbulence in our model. And we are able, so this is again Rossby and dipolarity, we are able for n row 3 to find uh, dipolar uh, magnetic field even at high Rossby numbers. Okay, so this is uh, in the process and we are arguing that um, in fact the important ratio is that of inertia to Lorentz and not of inertia to Coriolis. So this is uh, something which is again a work in progress. Sorry, I'm talking a lot about work in progress, but uh, it's in fact true. Okay, so I have a few minutes, I hope, uh, to, uh, it took some time already, to uh, tell you about cool stars, but I wanted also to, uh, to uh, talk a bit about more massive stars, which have a completely different uh, structure. They have convective uh, cores now and uh, radiative envelopes. So since I told you that uh, the main ingredients to produce uh, nicely um, a magnetic field at the surface of that we would observe at the surface of the star, we needed uh, convective motions and differential rotation. We imagine that this will probably not happen in a radiative zone. We are sure that convection zone doesn't happen. And uh, actually differential rotation is uh, that uh, the one which uh, we talked about for the sun is mostly due to the transport of angular momentum by convection. So this, no, this is again not going to happen in a radiative zone. So we expect uh, to have very different uh, magnetic fields in these stars. And actually it's the case, only five to 10% of these uh, more massive stars, so I'm talking here uh, again about uh, main sequence stars, 
uh, but more massive than this uh, intermediate mass, uh, something like uh, two uh, solar masses. Uh, so the uh, the five to ten percent of the the stars which possess a strong field are APBP stars, and the uh, other ones seem to possess either no field or a field which is so weak that it's uh, very difficult to detect. Okay. So this is uh, again uh, the, the same kind of. Uh, this was just the summary of uh, the observations. There were a lot of observations of uh, AP BP stars of the magnetic field among these stars. It's easy to see because you see you can reach uh, ten thousand ghosts, while in the sun the uh, dipolar structure is something like a few ghosts only. So the, they are uh, very very strongly magnetic. These stars. This is a histogram of uh, stars uh, and uh, so this is just a number and this is the amplitude of the field that you detect in these stars. Uh, so you see that you have some kind of threshold apparently. You detect only field which is above uh, in terms of uh, longitudinal field, the one which is seen along the field of view of something like 300 goes. Okay, uh, so this is not uh, of course um, an observational bias, you are completely able to see fields which are below 300 Gauss. Uh, it's just that there are none of these stars which are below uh, this uh, threshold. So there seems to be some kind of threshold and we want to understand why. Okay, so there was a, a theoretical scenario which was proposed, which was the following. Imagine that uh, you started with uh, just uh, any kind of poloidal field at the formation of the star, for example. Uh, you can have any field, strong and weak, okay, but with a continuous repartition. If you start with a very strong poloidal field and you have some differential rotation in, in your radiative zone still, okay, so, which can uh, be here because of uh, contraction effects, for example, uh, or, uh, or spin down effects. Uh, if you have a strong poloidal field, the differential rotation will try to shear it into a toroidal field, but it will be difficult because uh, magnetic tension has the property to fight against uh, this uh, shearing effect. This is the back reaction of the magnetic field on the flow that is, uh, uh, by the way, missing in the 2D models I was telling you about. So you, in fact, you are left with the strong uh, poloidal field you had at the beginning and a strong dipole. But if you start with a weak poloidal field, you can shear it by differential rotation into a strong toroidal field, B5 toroidal field, and this is known to be unstable, this uh, magnetic topology. If you, have a, you are completely dominated by one of the components, uh, in particular here, toroidal, it's going to be unstable, produce weak, uh, uh, produce small scale structures. And if you integrate along the line of sight, when you look at this uh, surface magnetic field, it will appear very weak, a very weak measured back at, uh, longitudinal field. Okay, so this would distinguish between the strong, uh, this population of strong field and a population with very small field, which would maybe be unable, would be unable to see possibly. And if you uh, write down the equation, you can actually see that this, uh, the threshold field, which distinguish between the two will be related to rotation because it will be in fact related to the amount of differential rotation as well. Uh, so this is just to finish the theoretical scenario. You start with any kind of B, any kind of omega. Uh, if uh, the field is strong, you're left with this strong field. If the field is weak, then you produce instabilities, which will produce small scale field only at uh, very weak levels. Now we are able to detect field which are at the sub ghost level. And in fact, there are a few stars which uh, are uh, A stars. So with uh, this similar structure as AP stars, but which uh, possess a very small magnetic field and uh, organized at very small scales. So much more complicated than the dipolar structure we have here. So we want to test uh, this uh, scenario with numerical simulations to see if we, we indeed get an instability in some cases. So what we did is that we started with an initial differential rotation, as you see here, and an initial poloidal field. So differential rotation is represented in color and the poloidal field is represented in contours, okay? So we start with uh, any uh, uh, differential rotation, any magnetic field, okay? And we want to see 
when uh, the field becomes unstable and what is the outcome of the instability? Is it going to build a, a field which is completely disorganized and which uh, would be, uh, if integrated along the line of sight, would produce a very small field? So by this, you produce, of course, by differential by the omega effect, a toroidal field that you can see here. And uh, you build this toroidal field in, uh, in typically what is what we relate to, or what uh, is this uh, time, sorry, is related to is an Alven time. Uh, the Alven time based on the, uh, the poloidal field we had here, okay? Uh, and we built a maximum of toroidal to poloidal field. We want to see if this configuration is unstable. It is, it is unstable as you see here. So what you see in this representation again is the same. This is a toroidal field, the background toroidal field, which becomes unstable to some kind of instability. So it took us a while to um, understand what this instability was. And we understood it by looking closely at it and, uh, and uh, relating it to uh, local um, uh, analysis, instability analysis. Um, uh, of uh, people in the 70s actually who, actually who already had some clues about MHD instabilities. So what you see here is the toroidal magnetic energy with respect to time at different azimuthal uh, wave numbers. Okay, so you, you, we can decompose our field into uh, M equals zero axisymmetric and then the non-axisymmetric uh, structures, okay. Uh, so the higher the M, the more nodes you have in the azimuthal direction. And you see that uh, we introduce a perturbation here. This is the axisymmetric toroidal field. And you see that you have a growth of a linear uh, instability uh, at a certain point, which grows for a uh, favored mode, which are more or less four, five, and six. The instability, if you look at it closely with uh, looking at uh, the, uh, perturb the, the perturbed magnetic field, you see it has a particular structure uh, with a lot of nodes in the latitudinal direction. And uh, this is a 3D view of, uh, of this uh, instability. The location of the instability is mostly on the maximum of uh, the, the field. So this convinced us that uh, this uh, instability was in fact of a magnetorotational type. Uh, the magnetorotational instability is mostly invoked uh, in uh, accretion disks. Uh, you need to have um, a rotation rate, which uh, so if we talk about uh, cylindr cylindrical uh, geometry, which uh, decreases uh, with um, uh, with uh, the axis of uh, rotation. And the uh, angular momentum also has to, to decrease, okay, to be stable hydrodynamically. But when you introduce a small magnetic field, it's able to, to destabilize the uh, shear. In fact, it's uh, an instability of the differential rotation itself, but uh, driven by the presence of a magnetic field. Okay, so we do have uh, this, uh, these uh, unst uh, unstable cases. Uh, we need to uh, find also stable cases, of course, because we want to have these two populations, okay? So in fact, what distinguishes between a stable and unstable is uh, the growth time of the instability com compared to the lifetime of the background field, okay? I told you that the background field, which uh, you could see here, is going to live for some time, but then it will decay because you have no forcing in this system. It's an initial value problem. Uh, so you want this uh, configuration to live a uh, time which is long enough so that the instability will develop on it, okay? And reach the level of the axisymmetric field to completely destroy the field. And this uh, will happen only if the growth time of the instability is uh, small compared to the lifetime of the field, okay? So in other term, meaning that uh, T omega is small compared to TAP. So this is what you see here. Uh, when this ratio is small, uh, so in fact, you see that uh, this means that rotation is fast compared to the poloidal field. Uh, then you will find uh, the instability completely killing your, uh, your uh, axisymmetric field. Um, and uh, when uh, this uh, ratio increases, then the instability grows, but uh, it's, uh, it has no time to develop before the uh, mean 
uh, axisymmetric field has already evolved and uh, changed to, to a different structure. Okay, so this, this was the main uh, um, outcome of the simulations we got, uh, and we were happy about this because uh, this, uh, this uh, criterion here, you can actually see that it's going to be related uh, to relate omega and the, uh, the, the dipolar field that we get. So the fact that uh, the uh, dipolar field we see in the APBP star could be connected to their rotation rate appears in this, uh, in this um, simulation, appears in the theoretical scenario, and also appears actually in the observations. Okay. I think I have uh, no time to tell you about uh, what happens when we introduce stable stratification. Uh, what you just need to, to know is that when we, uh, the, it was, um, uh, of course, uh, what I showed you before, uh, so I will jump to here. What I showed you before were uh, unstratified cases, meaning that we're doing a Boussinesque calculation. So you have no, um, well, you have both no uh, density contrast and both uh, uh, no entropy uh, variations, okay? You, you don't have a stratification in entropy. Now, if you introduce stratification in entropy, a stable stratification, really, which prevents radial motions to really develop, then you imagine that it will be a problem for the instability to, de to develop. And in fact, what we find is that we still find the instability even in the stratified cases. So this is a summary of what we get for the surface field for the unstratified cases in a, in a non-stable case and a stable case, and uh, for the stratified cases, unstable, stable. And you see that if I was looking uh, on, uh, at a star with a field like this, I would see a large-scale dipolar field. But if I was looking at a star like this, I would see a very weak field because th there would be a lot of uh, constellations of polarity here. So it seems to be indeed the case that the two populations are distinguished possibly because of this uh, presence of an MHD instability uh, due to the shear of, uh, due to the presence of a differential rotation. So this is more or less uh, it I wanted to show you. Um, we still have a lot of questions. Huh? I just, even for the sun, we are not sure what actually sets the cycle period in the sun. We are not sure that uh, the uh, models we are applying for the sun would really apply to other stars. Um, and uh, for uh, more massive stars, uh, there are still things to do because it's not completely clear uh, that uh, what kind of differential rotation you actually produce in a, in a radiative zone, uh, which is contracting, for example. So this is also still a, a work in progress. So there are more to come, of course, with a lot of uh, observational um, uh, instruments. And uh, that's it. I think I'll, I'll, I'll end up here. Thank you very much, Lorena. Uh, it you. was uh, very clear and very interesting. Um, so now, if uh, some of you have questions, please raise your hand uh, on the chat. No questions? If ah, no questions. <laughs> Okay, there is one. Frédéric, you can unmute and ask your question. Thank you for, uh, for this uh, very clear uh, seminar. And uh, I was wondering whether there is an attempt to then connect uh, this uh, work on the configuration of the field at the scale of the star, and then what can happen at larger scale to, for instance, uh, model some escape of particles, something like that. To, to, to connect to, the, to a possible wind from the star? Uh, yes, there are some uh, attempts, of course. Uh, the, uh, there are a lot of uh, interfaces uh, already, already here with the, all the models I showed you. 
uh, are uh, in fact models which uh, stop uh, before the surfa surface of the star because uh, they, are, mm -hmm. they all use uh, an approximation which is not valid when you get close to the surface. So going uh, even above <laughs> is uh, even more difficult, of course, but uh, there are some uh, some work, um, well, in fact, in particular, when I showed you um, when I showed you this uh, this plot, uh, we uh, extrapolated the field that we uh, get at the surface uh, to have a coronal field, and on top of this, we uh, ran a, a solar wind model. So it was a Rui Pinto who did this uh, uh, in Iraq, and he's developing, uh, in fact, 3D uh, wind models with uh, Alexis Rouillard, he, he did this when he was in Iraq. And uh, with this, we can actually model the uh, evolution of the wind in, uh, during the cycle due to the uh, presence of these active regions, which will uh, locally perturb the structure of the magnetic field. So indeed, uh, the, there are uh, connections like this. There are also people uh, looking at actual uh, magnetograms that you can get from uh, spectropolarimetry and trying to build a wind, a wind solution from the uh, boundary a magnetic field you have at the surface of your observed star. So this is, a, this is indeed um, uh, developing quite a lot uh, at the moment, uh, especially if you want to have also some uh, ideas of uh, what kind of uh, environment you have for exoplanets or this kind of stuff. It's, um, the, 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 in particular, for example, the fact that uh, Spirou is uh, looking in particular at, uh, at uh, M stars and at uh, exoplanets around M stars, there is an important part of uh, Spirou, which is to uh, detect a magnetic field on these uh, M stars. Uh, they are supposed to be very active, so produce a strong field. And uh, if you uh, are able to have an idea of the magnetic environment uh, around these exoplanets, you will have uh, also some ideas of uh, uh, how nice it is to, to be in these planets. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it's developing quite a lot at the moment. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, Robert, you have uh, on the observational side, what are the success and the limit of the present in the present situation? What is possible and what has yet to be achieved? I would say that uh, so spectropolarimetry was uh, was was is great. Uh, it's it's uh, it's very useful to have an idea of uh, the trends. Uh, uh, as I showed you in this confusogram, it's, it's really nice to have uh, this, uh, this kind of plots. I would, so th this is a great achievement to, to be able to have an idea of the magnetic topology of stars, which are seen as just a few pixels, which are seen, we are able to see the magnetic topology. It's, it's uh, impressive. Uh, but I would say, of course, the limitation is that we are, um, uh, we are limited to very large scales. Uh, and it, in fact, uh, it could be misleading because uh, possibly the main uh, magnetic energy is uh, located in the small scales, in fact. So what we see is only a very small part of uh, the magnetic energy. And uh, in fact, you see it when you do the 3D simulations, you produce, uh, you, you can actually produce dipolar structures, but it's sometimes completely lost uh, in this uh, very strong, um, small scale field. So in fact, uh, it's not really the dipole which is important, it's, it's, uh, it's the, the main magnetic energy is located in the small scale. So it would be nice to to have a possibility to extend, uh, but of course it's, it's difficult to see smaller scales, I guess. But I would say maybe it's, it would be one of the things to, to have a clearer view of, uh, of the importance of this large scale field compared to the small scale. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, if not, I'm going to thank you again, Lorraine. I'm going to stop the recording.